Welcome back for your second taste of the World Vegetable Center's International Vegetable Training Course. Today's session on the CMS system for pepper hybrid production is presented by Dr. Derek Barchinger, World Veg Vegetable Breeder. Okay, so we will continue our series on hybrid production and the CMS system in pepper. And in this lecture, this is part two, we will be discussing the molecular basis of CMS and RF in pepper. So this is going to get back to pretty basic information regarding the genetics and the genes behind CMS and RF. Um, and this is a pretty complex topic, but I think it's important to understand these things, at least in the basic form, uh, for whenever we want to develop our own CMS system. So um, we will start out with a summary of part one. So in order for a plant to be sterile in the CMS system, it must possess the CMS gene, as well as being homozygous recessive for all RF genes. So you can see here, a, a sterile line needs to be S, little rf, little rf. Either normal cytoplasm or heterozygosity and, or homozygosity at the rf alleles will result in pollen production. So as an as a overview, uh, CMS genes are encoded in the mitochondrial. And as we discussed last time, uh, these are maternally inherited. So they are coming from the mother. So all the progeny will have the same mitochondrial genome as their mother. CMS genes inhibit production of functional pollen in pepper. However, CMS has been identified in more than 150 species, the first one being onion, um, and it's widely used for hybrid seed production today uh, in agronomic as well as some vegetable crops. Uh, CMS was first reported in pepper over 65 years ago from an accession collected in India by Peterson. Um, and it was found later to be a natural interspecific hybrid between capsicum anum and capsicum frutescens. Now there's another way you can get CMS in pepper, and that is through an interspecific hybridization between capsicum anum and capsicum chocowinci. However, this frutescens anum hybrid is the primary source of CMS in pepper. So you can see briefly here, the uh, the two the sterile flower and the fertile flower, and we remove the petals. You can easily see that the anthers of the sterile flower are shriveled uh, and don't really produce pollen. The fertile flower have copious amounts of pollen on the anthers, and when we uh, when we take a look at these pollen grains under the microscope, the sterile flower really doesn't produce any pollen, and what it does produce is not functional. And here you can see on the right a, a large number of pollen tubes. So these pollen grains have germinated and are producing normal pollen tubes, thus are fertile. So here's just a very brief overview, uh, maybe back, back to your intro to genetics course. Uh, the mitochondria is the energy producing organelle in the cell and they possess their own genome. And unlike the genes or the, the chromosomes we are familiar with in the nucleus, the mitochondrial genome is circular. So you can see here in this image on the right, these purple strings, these strands, these are actually a loop. And those are the, the, the genome of the mitochondria. So they encode their own proteins. They do their own things. However, it's known that the nuclear genes can influence or control mitochondrial gene expression. And the same is true in the reverse, where mitochondrial genes can also influence nuclear gene expression. So CMS-associated genes, they do not have sequence similarity across species. They are the result of novel chimeric open reading frames, which are generated by fusion of several sequence segments through genome rearrangements. So this is only important, important to understand whenever we think about sequence similarity and species. So for some genes like disease resistance, I can look at a disease resistance, say from tomato, and I can take that gene 
and I can search the pepper genome and find a similar gene, and it's possible that that gene has, a sa has the same or very similar function. However, for CMS, you cannot do this. You cannot take the CMS gene of pepper and search the tomato genome and find a CMS gene. It, it won't work. There have been extensive rearrangements in the mitochondrial genome of CMS pepper lines reported. So here is, are two images. You can see on the right, we have a normal genome of a mitochondria of pepper, so a, a functional pollen producing line. And you can see these are divided in blocks based on color. So it starts here at the top with block one in this light purpley pink color. It then goes to dark pink, block two, block three, block four, block five. And you can see they're all going the same direction. They're all targeting clockwise. However, when we look at the CMS uh, mitochondrial genome, where block, well, well, block one is almost in the same spot. It's a little bit uh, to the left, but it's going the right direction. However, next we have block nine, which is way down here in the normal, but up here in the sterile. And it's also going counterclockwise, as is block 15, block 12. And then you can see here there's a huge number of blocks that are reversed and in the wrong order. So these types of rearrangements are what's causing the sterility in pepper. There's been two primary CMS-associated genes identified in pepper, and they interfere with mitochondrial function and pollen development. Primarily, they're both involved in ATP synthesis. So as we know, in order for CMS to be useful, we also need genes that restore fertility so that the pepper will produce fruit or, or chili. So um, RF genes are encoded in the nucleus and act to mask the effects of CMS. And most RF genes, not just in pepper, but in all species, encode what are called pentatrichopeptide repeat proteins or simply PPRs. And these are 35 amino acid sequence repeats, which form a helix turned helix structure. So here is a pictograph of, let's say, an RF gene here at the top. So you can see here is the start codon, here is the stop codon. And then in this side, this gene, we have these green box boxes, each of which encode a 35 amino acid PPR, which forms this helix turned helix structure. And when you have multiple PPR genes in a row, you get what is called a super helix, which has a unique groove. And so you can see here at the bottom of this image, we have this yellow line. This yellow line is the RNA of a CMS gene. And so what happens is this PPR gene, this, this, this RF gene binds to this RNA of this CMS uh, gene, and it doesn't allow transcription into or translation into a protein so it's preventing protein production and thus preventing function so the cms gene is there but it's not able to cause sterility because it's blocked by this rf gene this ppr so pprs are among the largest gene families in plants most species have more than 400 pepper has 552 um, they are highly conserved among land plants, both in protein activity as well as target sequence, which means that you can use previously identified PPRs to find new ones. And it's important to note here, they don't, they're not solely involved in restoration of fertility. They have many functions, uh, response to abiotic and bi biotic stress, um, through normal plant uh, physiology, you can find many, many proteins that are involved, uh, PPR proteins that are involved. There's also this special clade of R, uh, PPRs called RFLs, or restore of fertility-like genes. Um, and these typically form a cluster along with closely related or similar uh, PPR genes, while other uh, families of PPRs are more widely dispersed across the genome. It's known that plant species have anywhere from 10 to 30 RFLs, um, and they usually serve or they likely serve as a source for new RF genes that can emerge. So we know that the uh, mitochondrial genome is highly plastic. Its, its structural rearrangements are quite common. 
And so plants need a pool of genes that can rapidly overcome new CMS genes that form. So that's why they have these RFLs. So pepper has 12 RFLs. They're almost all located here on the distal end of chromosome six. There's one possibly more ancestral gene on chromosome one, or it could also be the result of retroduplication. So now that we roughly understand the genes, the genetics, the molecular basis for CMS and RF, we can talk about markers. So there are several molecular markers that have been developed for CMS in pepper, most of which are not really useful. Um, however, in 2014, there was a group out of China that developed a very reliable marker for S cytoplasm identification, and they called it SCAR-130. So here is a gel image of the, of the SCAR-130 band, and you can see we use 20 A and B line pairs. So here is 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, all the way to 20. And you can see that every time the A line produces a, a amplicon of around 130 base pairs, while the B line produces an amplicon of around 140 base pairs. So very easily you can rapidly distinguish A, B, A, B. And this, has been, this marker has been reported to be the most reliable marker for CMS, uh, several papers. We used it in over a thousand different breeding lines and it always works. So similar to CMS, several molecular markers have been developed in pepper. There's this CFR, CRF SCAR marker from 2006 that's working pretty well. This, this CO1MOD1 CAPS from 2016 is working well. And CARF648 is also working quite well. Uh, but it is genotype specific, which means that if you have a CMS line with that marker, you can track it in the progeny, but it doesn't always work for all CMS lines. Generally, for this RF markers, we find a lack of agreement between the genotype and the phenotype. So here's just a table showing uh, selection accuracy of R different RF genes in our material. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, these three here, the CO1MOD1 caps, the CRF SCAR, and the CARF648, these all have relatively high selection accuracy, although none are perfect. Um, there's, there's several reasons for this mismatch. Of course, we know there's a high number of RFLs. There's also the possible presence of multiple haplotypes. And then we also have the possibility of RF proteins that do not encode PPRs. So there, there could be different genes we're not finding. So here is very quickly how we can use the CRF SCAR and the SCAR 130 markers in a multiplex reaction. So a multiplex reaction is where you take DNA of a plant as well as the primers for this one, the CRF marker and the primers for the SCAR 130 marker and you combine them into a single tube to run PCR. So you only run one PCR reaction, but you run two markers in the same, in the same reaction. So you can see here, here we have labeled above the known C lines, the known B lines, and the known A lines. So you can see here the A line has the 130 base pair band from the SCAR marker, and it doesn't have any banding from CRF marker. The uh, B line has 140 base pair amplicon from the SCAR marker, and again, no CMS marker or CRF marker. And then the C lines, they have the 140 base pair uh, amplicon from the SCAR marker for CMS, but they also have the CRF marker from RF. So you can see these are C lines, these are B lines, and then these are A lines. So this is a very easy way to rapidly test your material. However, as I mentioned, these are not 100%. And you would also need to do test crosses to confirm the presence of A, B, and C line in your material. So this has been just a very quick uh, and basic uh, overview of the molecular basis of CMS and RF and PEPPER. 
If you want more information or have any questions, my email is there on the screen. In the next lecture, now that we have an understanding of how CMS and RF works, we will discuss the development of A lines and B lines for CMS in Pepper.